Okay. Kabbalah decoded, filling the vessels and living on leftovers. Now, don't misunderstand this, living on leftovers is, um, although it is, seems to be the habit of certain college students, but um, we're not talking about that at all over here. We're talking about a completely different concept in leftovers. Now, um, probably on the opening screen, when you came on before, you probably saw uh, some of the quotes from Kings. I'll get back to that in a minute, but just before we get there, I just want to explain something. Very often when we get a story told in Tanakh, in other words, in a biblical story or a story in one of the prophets, although the event actually happened, nevertheless, not every event that happened is recorded. But those that are recorded are recorded for a very good reason. And that reason is that they have in them a lesson, a, a, a timeless teaching that can be applied right throughout the generations to all kinds of people in all kinds of situations. The story that we are going to uh, learn about tonight, uh, we'll read it soon, is just one of those stories. It is a story with tremendous depth to it. And it's really talking about, largely, what happens in our times or in the times when even in a specific instance, when I said it happens in our times, I meant more sort of in a general way, that generally the generation seems to be in a situation of, we don't feel very holy or spiritual a lot of the time. It also applies to the individual situation, the situation of the individual, where a person has spiritual ups and downs, as we all know. What happens when a person is in somewhat of a spiritual slump on an individual basis or on a com community basis, maybe affecting even the entire world? So that's what the, what the story deals with and gives various answers or uh, bits of advice uh, as to how to deal with them. So let me share the screen and you will soon see the... Um, Yeah, you'll soon see the um, the quote from the prophets. Uh, is that clear for everybody? Uh, is it small enough to fit on the screen for everybody? Too big? Too small? Okay. Perfect. All right. Very good. Okay, so as you can see, uh, it's from Kings. Those of you who can read Hebrew can read it on your own in the Hebrew. Uh, I'm going to just do it in English because most people here are probably not that familiar with the Hebrew. So, um, if you are, you can see where to find it. It's in Malachim Bet, Perik Dalid, Pasuk Aleph Ve'elach. Yeah, Aleph Pez Gimel Dalad, Hei Vav. Maybe Zion. In any event, I'm going to read in the English and then we'll start discussing it. Um, and if you have any questions along the way, please just write in the chat box. So, one woman from among the wives of the prophet's disciples cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, has died. Now the creditor has come to take my two sons to be his slaves. Um, let me just give a little bit of background to this verse. This woman, although it's not mentioned who she is in this particular instance, she happened to be the wife of the prophet Ovadia. She was the wife of the prophet Ovadia, and her husband had died or was killed. And uh, now the creditors come to take her two sons to be slaves. That was in uh, ancient times perhaps um, more common than we would like to think that um, if you owed a debt, then you had to work it off, like sort of like creditors' prisons that they had in England, except here you could actually work off the debt uh, by doing <coughs> whatever labor the creditor wanted you, wanted you to do. In any event, that was the situation. 
So she comes to the prophet Elisha. Elisha was the disciple of Elijah, Eliyahu. Elisha was one of the great prophets, and he had asked that when Elijah, Eliyahu, wanted to appoint him as his successor, he said, only on one condition, that I'll be able to do twice as many miracles as you do. Now, the reason for that is not because he was arrogant or because he wanted to show off or anything like that. Uh, but um, simply because he felt that the generation was such that much more would be required of him than was required of Elijah. In fact, that was uh, that was true. This was the time when they were going through tremendous um, upheavals in um, in the region. And he felt that he needed uh, the spiritual strength to be able to overcome it. And in fact, it was granted to him. Uh, to be asked, everybody is an indentured servant. Yes, an indentured servant. A slave in that sense. Although, if that's if the creditor uh, was a Jewish person. We don't know. But a Jewish person is not is obligated at the most to take an indentured servant for a certain period of time in order to pay for debt, but not more than that. And he has to be treated not as a uh, slave, but as a servant. In any event, <coughs> so Elisha said to her, verse 2, Elisha said to her, what can I do for you? Tell me what you have in the house. She said, your maidservant has nothing in the house except for one jar of oil. In other words, she'd already pawned off everything else in order to keep her and her children alive and to pay their debts and to pay the rent and this and that and the other. And uh, she had nothing left. It was just a jar of oil, no food even, just a jar of oil. Now, we'll see the significance of that in one minute. One jar of oil is a very significant um, concept. We'll come back to that shortly. So he said, Elisha, the uh, prophet said, go borrow a vessel for yourself from the outside. In other words... She had already pawned off everything. Go borrow from other people, from all your neighbors. Empty vessels. Do not be sparing. Go as borrow as many as you can. Then go into your house and shut the door behind you and behind your sons. Pour oil from that one jar of oil that she had into all these vessels and carry away the full ones. She went from him, shut the door behind her and behind her children. They brought vessels to her and she poured. And she, in fact, continued pouring until all of the vessels were full. And verse 6, when all the containers were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. He said, there are no more. And the oil stopped pouring. Very miraculous event. She came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your creditor, and you and your sons will live on the remainder. You'll live on the leftovers. The remainder of the money or the remainder of the oil. We will see shortly how to interpret that. Okay, so let's go back now to the beginning. So this woman from amongst the wives of the prophet's disciples, the um, she is described as among the wives of the prophet's disciples, but in Kabbalah, this the the uh, the woman that we're talking about is. In fact, a rem is it's a hint to the soul. It's a hint to the soul. So the soul's relationship to God is always one of female to male, receptive to um, active. God is the giver, so to speak, and uh, the soul is the receiver. And as we say in the morning prayers, God, the soul that you have given into me, or if you're placed in me. In other words, the soul, that's where it comes from. It's given. It's not something we manufacture per se. <coughs> and therefore, it is regarded as receptive. And woman, in this case, means receptive. It's not a, um, um, a disparaging term in any sense. But one of the women is from among the wives of the prophet's disciples now. All souls are, in fact, the disciples of prophets. 
Now, this particular soul, why, why are all souls the disciples of prophets? Because all souls have, at least in potential, if not in actuality, have the ability to become prophets themselves. But how do you become a prophet yourself? Through being a disciple of a prophet, through being a disciple of someone who has uh, a, a channel, so to speak, has opened up a channel to God through his soul. So we are the children, we are the, sorry, the wives of, and the wives of the disciples of the prophets. In other words, we are the receptive channels for the prophets um, teachings and methodologies and manners and methods of getting closer to God. Um, so he wouldn't be uh, he wouldn't be a wife of the prophet's disciple. He would be one of the prophets. Uh, Tobi is asking, what about someone who had an original soul? Someone who has an original soul, in other words, one that was not in incarnation before, would be a prophet and not a wife of a wife of a prophet's disciple. In any event, this soul comes out and cries out to Elisha. Elisha, um, the the Kabbalistic works say Elisha really refers to God. Elisha, my God of the the letters Shin Ayin. If you look across here in uh, in the Hebrew, the word Elisha can really be divided into two words: Eli and Sha. El Eli means my God, and Sha means it's a concept in Kabbalah called the Shin Ein Nohorin, the 370 lights that come out, that descend, that shine out from the internal aspect of Keter. Sha is the Sha'ashuim. Sha'ashuim means the delight that resides in the innermost aspect of Keter. That's called Sha. So in other words, my God of transcendent delight okay so she comes to Elisha ostensibly the prophet but also talking about according to Kabbalah talking about the man of the the uh, grasping of godliness through the delight of the soul the inner delight of the soul and she says as follows your servant my husband has died that aspect of the soul that is awake to godliness has died. The truth is, no aspect of the soul ever dies, but it is so fast asleep that it's as if it's in a coma, right? It's as if it's die, as if it died. So she said, that's the way she felt it. She felt, in other words, the soul feels that my enthusiasm, my my uh, delight in God has died. It's in a state of, it's in a coma. Can be revived, but it has died. And now the creditor has come to take my two sons to be his slaves, and the creditor now refers to, the creditor refers to, the word for uh, creditor in Hebrew is hanoshe. So in Kabbalistic works, it explains that Hanoshe means the one who causes me to forget. Kinashani Elohim. God has caused me to forget. It's another verse from elsewhere. But the creditor here, in that sense, is a um, is explaining Kabbalah, the Nefesh Bahamit, the animal soul that a person has. Every person is endowed essentially with two forces within him. One is the force of godliness, and the other, was, the other is the sort of animal, natural, um, the, the life force of nature. There's the divine life force and the life force of nature. And there's a constant struggle between the two of these for supremacy. If anyone wants to read up more about this, <coughs> it's the first part of the book of Tanya, up till um, 
uh, really up till chapter 12, even further, but at least up till chapter 12, um, from chapters 1 to 12, discusses this at great length. It's not the time to get into it now, but that is who the creditor is. The creditor is the animal soul, so to speak. The survival, the physical survival consciousness, as opposed to the godly consciousness of um, the divine soul. So the creditors come to take my two sons to be his slaves. Who are the two sons? The two sons, says Kabbalah, are love and awe. Love and awe. These are the two primary powers of the soul. Those are called the sons. The two sons, love and fear, or love and awe. Love of God and awe of God. And the credit of the animal soul has come to take them because the love that I feel is only for physical things. I feel a lust for physical things. I feel a fear from physical things. I'm afraid of physical matters. So the two sons who really ought to be the love and awe or fear of God are now being dragged into the love and fear of an animalistic type. Animalistic type, love and fear. Love meaning being drawn towards, lusting for, and fear recoiling from, withdrawing from, but for the wrong reasons. So Alicia said to her, what can I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? Now this is a very significant question that he asks over here. What can I do for you? That's normal. But tell me what you have in the house. In other words, in order to be able to tie spiritual development to anything, there has to be some basis on which to, uh, to, on which to, tie it, uh, to tie it to. There has to be something there in order to allow, enable the further development. If there's absolutely nothing there, then it's true that it's completely died. So he's asking, what is it that you have? What do you have left? What do you have in your house? What is still there? Is there anything left? Is there anything left with which we can build? Similarly with the story of Hanukkah, which we will uh, discuss uh, in about a month from now. All the oil was defiled, and there was only one jar of oil left. And that's the oil that they lit for the menorah. Same thing over here, he's asking, what do you have left? And she says, all I have is one jar of oil. The one jar of oil is very symbolic and very significant in terms of um, uh, Kabbalistic thought. The jar of oil represents, just like the jar of oil of Hanukkah, which was not defiled by the Greeks, it's that level of the soul which can never be defiled. So she says, I have nothing other than that undefiled and undefilable, if there is such a word, untaintable, level of the soul. That's all I have left, one jar of oil. So he said, okay, if you have a jar of oil that, can, that we can use, go and borrow vessels for yourself from the outside, go and borrow vessels from other places, from all your neighbors, empty vessels, do not be sparing, in other words, borrow a lot of vessels, and then what she does is she goes and she pours out oil and uh, from, the, from the jar, and the oil from the jar fills all of the vessels that she has, and then she's able to sell the oil and to uh, live on the proceeds, go pay her, pay her debts and live on the proceeds. So it was a lot of oil. Um, now, <clears throat> let's just pause in the story over here and explain what this uh, pouring the oil into the empty vessels is all about. So, he says, first of all, it's clear to me that you have no vessels of your own. You have to go and borrow vessels. They don't belong to you, but you can use them. 
the Kabbalists explain that these empty vessels that we're talking about, these vessels are the Torah and the mitzvot, the commandments, the commandments of the Torah. It said, go and borrow them. In other words, even if you haven't acquired them as your own, they don't feel like they belong to you yet. They're not yours in the sense that they're, they become part of you. Even if they're not part of you, even if it's something foreign to you, even if it's something that's very distant from you, they belong to other people. It doesn't belong to you. Nevertheless, go and borrow those vessels from others from the outside, from your neighbors, and make sure that those vessels are empty vessels. Make sure that those vessels have nothing in them. In other words, make sure that the mitzvot, the commandments that you bring to the table are not full of ego. You're not doing them in order to aggrandize yourself. You're not doing them in order to make yourself famous. You're doing them in an empty way, empty of you. That is what our sages teach. Our sages teach that only an empty vessel can be filled. Meaning to say, a vessel without ego is truly a vessel. A vessel that is full, full of itself, cannot contain anything. So he said, go and borrow empty vessels, do not be sparing. There's another, uh, further, a further explanation of this, which is that the empty vessels are actions which do not have, which are not filled or not uh, imbued with love and or they're vessels which are empty in the sense that they're empty of the love and all with which a commandment should really be for uh, be performed you don't you're not holding by that he says to her i understand that you're not holding your the love that you would normally feel when you do a mitzvah when you do a command when you fulfill a commandment or the awe of god that you feel when you normally do a commandment that you don't have. You just told me that you don't have. You don't have anything in your house except this jar of oil. You only have the essence of the soul. You have nothing else. So therefore, bring empty vessels, actions. Do the actions even though the actions are not imbued with oil, with a source of light. Oil was always used for light. In fact, the word for oil is Yitzhar. One of the words for oil is, uh, besides Shemin, is Yitzhar. Yitzhar is uh, from the word Sohar, meaning light or window. It's that which brings light. So even bring empty vessels. Now, this is a, this is a, a very this in itself is also a very important concept because there's actually a famous uh, work <coughs> which is called Sefer Hachinuch or essentially the Book of Education. It was written, um, it was written probably um, more than a thousand years ago, well, around a thousand years ago probably. Sefer um, Chinuch. And one of the explanations that he gives, it's a, it's a book which discusses the uh, mitzvot, the commandments of the Torah. So one of the commandments that he discusses is the uh, Pesach, the, the, the Passover offering. One of the laws regarding the Passover offering is that you cannot break the bones of the Passover offering, even though it's meat, which is roasted over a fire. It's a lamb, which is ro it's roasted lamb. When you eat the meat as part of your obligation on Passover, you can eat the meat, but you cannot crack the bones to get at the marrow inside or whatever. Don't crack the bones. So he explains the reason behind this. He, explains, he says the reason you don't crack the bones, even though it's a, it says explicitly in the Torah, but it doesn't say the reason for it. He gives a suggestion. The suggestion is as follows. Don't crack the bones because that's a poor man's way of doing things. He doesn't have enough food, so he has to crack the bones to get to the marrow. And he can, so he can eat, uh, he can suck the bones as well. <clears throat> Since Passover is a time of freedom and a time of magnanimity and a time when you feel uh, that everything is in abundance. 
Therefore, you shouldn't be cracking the bones. So uh, the question could be asked: What what does it matter? What what do I care if I crack the bones or not? Even if I'm if I, even if I am feeling a, a sense of wealthiness, maybe I like just cracking the bones. It says no. Your emotions follow your actions. It's true that actions follow emotions as well, but in, but 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 sometimes the action leads the emotion. So is after your actions, your heart is drawn. So therefore, when a person does actions, which are Positive actions, actions which are good actions, activities which are which are positive and beneficial activities. Even though the person does not feel an arousal of love or fear, love and awe when he does them or she does them, but since they are positive actions in and of themselves, therefore they will event they will eventually lead to those results. <laughs> After the actions, the heart is drawn. So if a person acts in a certain way, even though he doesn't believe it, even though he doesn't feel it, but he acts in a certain way and he does it consistently, he, she, obviously, does it consistently, eventually the action itself will become imbued with the feeling that it ought to arouse. That is one of the secrets of the mitzvot. A person does a mitzvah, fulfills a commandment, even though perhaps he doesn't understand it, doesn't feel anything, is not uh, doing it out of love or awe or anything else, or even faith, but just simply going through the motions. So he says, going through the motions is also important. Going through the motions is also important. That can bring you full vessels. So you start off with empty vessels. Lots and lots of empty vessels, lots and lots of action. Activities, positive activities. And even if they're empty, don't worry about it. They will soon be full. As he says, then go in and shut the door behind you and behind your sons. In other words, do certain things have to be done in private. They're not for publication. Good deeds should not always be publicized. Um, sometimes it's beneficial to publicize them. But in a general sense, people publicize things only when they... Um, um, when they get, uh, they sort of get, um, you know, famous from it or whatever. That eh, that's not the, that's not the way they go about go about things. Positive actions should very often be done behind closed doors. In other words, charitable work, helping out others. You don't have to have your names uh, name up in lights in Hollywood uh, in order to uh, in order to have done a good thing. You could do a good thing anonymously too. On the contrary, sometimes it's better because when one does things not anonymously. Then, uh, but for the sake of fame or for the sake of, uh, of of praise or something like that, then the action can in fact become tainted. So he tells her, in your situation where you do not feel love and awe, do many, many actions, positive actions. This is the way Kabbalah explains it. Pour, and then that will be pouring oil into the vessels. In other words, the oil of your soul. This one jar of oil, which is representative of your soul, of the lumin luminousness of your soul, pour it into the vessels. You're not feeling anything now, but do everything that you do from your essence. You might not feel love, you might not feel fear, but do it from your essence. Do it with total dedication. And once you have done that, carry away the full ones, in other words, let the full ones be um, be kept. The full actions, let them be kept and and uh, and and put aside. Anyway, she goes that. She goes and does that. And when all containers were full, bring me uh, bring me another vessel. There were no more. And then she comes to the uh, verse seven again. She came and told the man of God, and he said, "Go and sell the oil and pay your creditor." Sell oil, pay your credit. In other words, once you have the, all of those good deeds that you have done, it is easy to get rid of the nefesh Bahamut, get rid of the animal soul, the soul that the aspect of ourselves which wants to drag us down and wants to drag us into darkness. Go and pay your creditor. In other words, 
now you have a tremendous amount of the source of light in your actions. You have the oil in the vessels, you have the source of light in your actions. Now you can illuminate the place and that will chase the creditor away, so to speak. It'll pay, pay off and get rid of the creditor and then you and your sons will live on the remainder. You will live on the leftovers. Now, what does this mean? It means that once you have aroused the essence of the soul through positive actions, now you can live on the remainder, meaning to say the remainder is actually the remainder of oil which was never poured into the vessels. It's not the remainder of oil which is in the vessels that she had and she keeps. It says that all the rest, you can now live on all the rest of the oil that was never even in the vessels. In other words, you can now live, <coughs> you and your sons, you and your love and awe of God will be able to live in an awakened state through the essence of the soul which is never even um, imbued within the within the physical realm, imbued within the body. You'll now be able to live on a transcendent level, which is called the remainder. You and your sons will be able to live on that transcendent level. Now, how do you get to that transcendent level, which is called the remainder? Now, when we say the remainder, usually what we mean is the leftovers, right? What's left? The minute amount, the little bit that's left over after she's paid off her creditors. No, here it doesn't mean that. You and your sons will now be able to live once you've done, once you've gone through the procedure, you'll be able to live on the remainder on all that oil which was not poured into the vessels. On the essential oils, so to speak. The oil of the essence. You'll be able to live on that. You'll be able to live, the, uh, the expression in Kabbalah is actually you'll be able to live in the, using the kohot makifim. You'll be able to use the, the powers that envelop a person, not the powers in the vessels. In order to be able to do that, you have to arouse the love and awe of God through actions. But once you are, have accomplished those actions, those actions will now connect to something that, um, that, that, that completely transcends you, that's called the remainder, that completely transcends you, and you'll be able to live now on a level of transcendence so that the debt collector will never, never need to come to you again. The Nefesh Bahamut, the animal soul, will not bother you any further. A person will be living with what is called in uh, technical language called living with Mesirut Nefesh, living with total self-dedication, dedication of the self to a higher cause. And that's what she was told to do. So, just to recap um, and explain it uh, a little bit better. When a person is in, is in a state of um, not being able to When a person is in a state of not being able to arouse the love and fear of God that he normally would, he or she normally would uh, or ought to experience, and the person cries out to the man of God or directly to God, in fact, um, that I'm losing it. My powers of love and fear are being dragged into all kinds of other area, other areas where they don't belong. Then, in such circumstances, says the prophet, go and get vessels, act, do actions, and even if the actions are um, are you don't feel love and awe when you do these actions, nevertheless, make sure that the vessels are empty. They're empty of ego. And then just do the actions with devotion and do and put yourself into them as much as you can. Then the vessels start to fill up. But they're not just filled up with love and awe now. They're filled up with essential, the oil of the essence, the essence of the person, that which gives essential light in a person's life. And 
then all of the vessels become filled and one can make one's way through the world living on not only the um, uh, the full vessels, but one can go and live in a state of transcendent transcendence, which is called living on the remainder, living on that which is the inspiration, which is higher than ourselves. And that is the story. Now, why do we read the story? Because this is actually the meaning of the Haftorah which is read on this coming Sabbath, uh, coming Shabbat, the Haftarah is, is the, the story, is actually the story, part of the Haftarah, part of the readings from the Prophets, which we read in the uh, synagogue on uh, on a Saturday, on Shabbos, is actually this story, and that's why we're reading it now. But that's the inner meaning of the story. Okay, any questions? No questions. Whoa. All right. Sucking it on. <laughs> All right. So, um, let's. Oh, my grandson's name. <laughs> my grandson's name is Yaakov Yehuda. I'm sorry, not Yaakov, Yosef Yehuda. <laughs> Yosef Yehuda. <clears throat> Joseph Yehuda, Yosef Yehuda. Um, and by the way, which I didn't mention, um, on Sunday, my youngest son became a chassan. He became a, um, he got engaged. <laughs> So lots of good things going on all around. Uh, yep. I still have another couple or not, but... Um, all right, I should say the word again that indicates total dedication. It's you and your sons will live on the remainder. Um, that's the indication of total dedication. But the word really what you're... The word you're looking for is Mesirut Nefesh. I'll write it here. Mesirut nefesh. Mesirut means giving over nefesh, your soul. Giving over your life. Giving over your... Um, yeah, lots of good things happening. Um, yes, this absolutely does apply to someone who was religious in his younger years, but does not now feel anything. That's the way to do it. The way to do it is to do actions and to put yourself into them. Um, actions which you feel you can do. For example... Um, I'll just tell you an interesting story, um, and I think it's it's kind of relevant because um, it certainly woke up in me a uh, a certain awareness that I didn't have before. This is talking about when I was much much younger, and the world was a much safer place. Now, much much younger is you know like more than a century ago, right? So, okay, so last century, yeah, physical actions, yes. Um, so, <clears throat> in the last century. <laughs> When uh, when I was a youngster, <clears throat> about 15 years old, so it was very um, common for uh, young guys like me um, and my friends. We would all go down to the coast. We lived inland. Uh, I'm from South Africa originally, so we lived in Johannesburg, and we go down to the coast of Cape Town, which is about a thousand miles away. And how do you get there? You don't take a train, you don't take a bus, you don't take a plane. In those days, you stuck out your thumb and you hitchhiked which is perfectly safe in those days. So, that's what we did. Uh, a friend and I were hitchhiking, and we were going down to the coast. Now, um, of course, we'd stop off for the night in, uh, in you know, various places, usually just camp out in, uh, in uh, various places. We had our own tent, and uh, we would camp. So, um, we arrived in a certain town, and we needed to replenish our supplies. But um, we did not know that in that particular province, province like a state, there was a provincial holiday 
on the day that we arrived uh, and all the banks were closed so we couldn't get any money out of the um, they didn't have ATMs in those days you actually had to go into the bank so um, the banks were closed with so we, we had very little money left on us but we had just enough to buy ourselves some uh, a loaf of bread and some milk and um, so that's what we did. We went to the sort of uh, cafe, and um, uh, it was in a small little, small little town, really, I don't know, a provincial town. So we, we asked the guy for uh, bread and milk. So he says, uh, he started to ask us questions, and um, he, uh, he said, yeah, well, you, you know, you know, you're obviously not from around here. Where are you from? And we told him the story, and uh, then we just happened to mention to him that, uh, you know, we were um, passing through, and we, you know, the, 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 we, that's a bank holiday today, and we weren't able to get money out of the bank. So in the meanwhile, he was offering us uh, some sandwiches and some tea and this and that and the other, whatever. We didn't want to take it, <clears throat> and um, um, he started sitting down and talked to us for uh, you know half an hour, three quarters of an hour, something like that, forty-five minutes. And then eventually he went over to the cash register and took out some money and gave it to us. And he said, "Yeah." I said, "No, no, we don't. You know, so we, it's okay. We don't. Uh, you know, we, we we're not desperate. We're okay." So I said, "No, I want you to have it, but we're not coming back this way. How are we going to pay you back?" So he says, "No, you're not going to pay me back. You're going to pay it forward. You're going to pay it on. You you'll do the same thing for somebody else another time." Um, and that was, you know, that for me was, you know, as a young kid, like that was, that was really an eye opener. That was like an altruistic thing. He wasn't expecting any payment. His payment was pay it forward, give it to somebody else. Eventually, when you're in such a situation, give it to somebody else. That's the kind of thing that I mean. That's the kind of activity. It doesn't have to be necessarily religious activities as we see them in the Torah itself, although those for sure are good. But just that kind of openness towards another human being, just listening to somebody else's story, sympathizing with them, empathizing with them, helping a person out that you know they could do with uh, with, with with a few bucks, um, helping an old lady across the street, helping a neighbor who recently had a loss in his family or whatever, his or her family. Those kinds of things are when you when there's when it's altruistic, there's no expectation of reward and not even a thought of a reward. Those are the kinds of things which are really the pure oil that we're talking about. Now <clears throat> um, yeah uh, it happens it happens EIL that some some sometimes people are ultra orthodox and they become alienated. And um, the best thing to do in such situations, uh, although obviously without knowing the person, it's very hard to say. But the best best thing to do is just no criticism, no judgment, just openness towards uh, such a person. If you're open to them and uh, hear them out, it's obviously coming from a place of pain and perhaps a place of suffering. Something was. Um, Perhaps a person was mistreated or something like that, you know, who knows. Uh, but that's the best way to approach it. Um, does this Mesirid Nefesh relate to the world of Asiya? Um, it relates to all of the worlds. It relates to any of the worlds. It, it, the action is in the world of Asiya, but the end result is in the world of Atzilut, or even higher than that. Act for the Creator, exactly. Now, it's a very touching story. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I certainly feel it's a touching story, but the truth is that everybody experiences these stories. You just have to think about them. And you will, If you go back in your life and you think about it, you'll note that there are, you'll notice that there are many, many stories that have sort of been pushed to the back of our minds where someone did a kind deed of one sort or another, and perhaps you didn't even notice it at the time, or perhaps you did, but have yet to pay it forward. And uh, now you have a good opportunity. Um, 
can I give more detail concerning this concept? Which particular concept? I'm not sure which you what you're referring to, Annie. Which particular concept? The concept of Mesirut Nefesh of yeah, Mesirut Nefesh, yeah. Um yeah. Mesirut Nefesh means Mesirut means giving over entirely. Nefesh is your soul, but it also means your life. So, we're not saying that a person has to completely dedicate his life every waking minute uh, and every sleeping minute, in fact, to uh, some particular cause. We're not saying that. It doesn't mean that. It does mean that as well. But what it does mean is a, a, an act which is completely selfless, or at least as selfless as it's possible for it to be. Like, for example, giving charity anonymously. You don't know who you're giving it to necessarily, and they certainly don't know who it's coming from. That's the highest level of charity, as Maimonides points out. When you don't know who you're giving to, you give it, let's say, to an organization, and they distribute it, you don't know who you're giving it to, and they don't know who it's coming from. Completely selfless. Um, so, the idea is that you you do an action with complete devotion, complete dedication, throwing yourself completely into it. Now, it doesn't matter what the act is; it could be just, it could be a minor thing. Um, there's a story told about the um, uh, the daughter of Rabbi Akiva. The daughter of Rabbi Akiva, at her wedding fe feast, the famous, famous Rabbi Akiva one of the famous, the most famous sages of the Talmud. In fact, the, the entire Talmud follows his way of thinking. So the story is told at his daughter's wedding. His daughter was a very, an extremely, extremely kind person. It happened at the wedding that a poor person walked in. And the waiter, seeing that he wasn't an invited guest, uh, didn't go and offer him any food. They didn't go and uh, give him, uh, you know, give him a give him a place to sit and a plate. Now, Rabbi Akiva's daughter, who was the, the she was the kala, she was the bride, saw this and was horrified that this poor man was not getting uh, getting served. So she uh, she had a pin in her hair um, that was keeping a veil on her, as you know, brides have veils and this kind of thing, whatever. So she took the pin out to take the veil off, so she could go and serve the um, uh, this poor person, and stuck the the pin into a crack in the wall behind her. The wall there was a wall behind where she was sitting. Uh, it's a wall made of stone wall, not a not a plastered wall, but a stone wall. And between the bricks, between the rocks, there were there were like cracks between the rocks, as you know, a stone wall. So she stuck the pin into that wall, and then she went and served the poor man. Turns out, afterwards they discovered that the pin when she stuck the pin right into the head of a poisonous snake and killed it without knowing she was doing it. Without knowing she was doing it. What saved the day that snake could have killed her or killed somebody and could have, uh, uh, um, could have um, uh, bitten somebody? Her generosity and her her being horrified at the fact that she wasn't that that there was a guest who wasn't being served even though he wasn't invited but a poor person who could probably use the food more than most of the guests so she went over to take a plate herself to uh to to this poor person that kind of thing without us knowing it necessarily could save the day for somebody else to such an extent that it could save a life um, finding them a job is fine, yeah. If you find a person a job, uh, that's for sure, that's for sure a good thing. Um, 
I'll come back to that later, Yael. Um, a donor who assisted in her husband. Act of kindness. Right. Uh, Yael is talking about, uh, I think Yael is talking about uh, her husband was actually very ill at one time and um, I think it was bone marrow, bone marrow transplant or something like that. Is that right? Right. Bone marrow transplant. There you go. An act of kindness, selflessness, giving blood. Um, giving giving food to a food bank. But doing it with with a wholeheartedness, you know, doing it with uh, dedication. And all kinds of actions. Uh, you'd be surprised if you if you look for opportunities to help out people. You'll find that there's hundreds of opportunities a day, <laughs> every day. I make a habit of uh, of of giving. Many people do as well, but I make a habit of giving charity every morning. Every morning, um, hopefully without fail. Uh, you know, take out a couple of dollars, and if there's someone who needs it, if I don't find anybody who needs it, I put it in a charity box. It's a good thing to do. Keep a box for charity. <clears throat> Every day, put a few pennies or a dollar, <clears throat> a few dollars, whatever your financial situation, and then give it away. Give it away to, uh, you know, the... Um, Give me a society uh, for breast cancer, for um, whatever, for blind society, whatever, right? Right, and that's the way to do it. Help feed the help feed the homeless. Yeah, right. Those are the kinds of things. And do it with, and those are the actions which, what if one does selflessly. That's what fills up the oil and allows you eventually to live on the remainder, to live on the leftovers. All right, folks. Uh, we'll have a class again Sunday, hopefully. And uh, we'll look